We're beginning a brand new series, all right? We tried to begin it last week. We're going to just count that as part 0 0.1, 0 0.5. That's a halfway point. But hopefully this morning we get an opportunity to really establish a firm foundation in this new sentence that God is speaking to us, this new revelation that God is building in us. Remember, every series God is giving us something to mature us. Every series, God is unveiling, he is, un he is disclosing, or he is revealing a truth that is needed for our maturity. So I don't want you to think that we're just talking. It is needed. Everybody say it's necessary. It's necessary. And so for the next few weeks, we're going to be dealing, we're going to be diving, we're going to be delving into this series called Road Rage. Road Rage. And I'm going to tell you what really kind of opened this up for me is something that I've been marinating with probably for the past four months. Our creative team can tell you this is not a new series. It's not a, knee, it's not a new thought. It's not a knee-jerk reaction of revelation. It is truly something the Lord has been really putting pressure on me for the past four months or so. And it started out just like most of us where I was driving. And I, I, I was seemingly not going fast enough for the person behind me. They start riding my bumper. I start getting a little nervous. And you know some of us, if you got a little bit of petty, if you got a little bit of petty in you. <laughs> I knew this was going to be a good series, man. I know I, the closer they got, the slower I started to drive. Just start putting on my brakes, amen. Until they sped around me. And y'all know this, they sped around me going fast to go nowhere. They end up getting right behind another vehicle and I said, yeah, that's right. Amen. Slow down. And you'll be surprised how many people almost kill people on their way to nowhere. Rushing to nowhere. Ain't got no job. Ain't late for nothing. They just want to put the pedal to the metal. And see how fast they can go. Some of us done got in accidents like that. Going faster than we should. All right? And I got a lot of stuff. It's, it's boiling in me. Right? Uh, and so we're going to spend the next couple of weeks dealing with the laws of traffic. The science of traffic. The rhythm of traffic. There are some of you, you are frustrated because nothing's moving in your lane. All right. Nothing's moving in your life. The Lord's going to give you patience. The Lord's going to give you wisdom. Over the next few weeks, the Lord is going to teach you how to navigate the traffic in your life. And it is going to be good. But we're going to begin starting. We're going to begin building the foundation from Deuteronomy 32. Let's go to Deuteronomy 32. Come on. We're going to do some Old Testament. And then we're going to go to the New Testament. Let's go to Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32. When you get it, we're going to go all the way down to verse number 50. Deuteronomy 32, and go all the way down to verse number 51. We're going to start at verse number 51. When you got it, let me know you got it by saying, I got it. Because ye trespassed against me among the children of Israel. Talking about while the people of God watched at the waters of Mirabah Kadesh. In the wilderness of Zin, because ye sanctified me not, look at this, because ye sanctified me not in the midst of the children of Israel, yet thou shalt see the land before thee, but thou shalt not go thither unto the land which I give to the children of Israel. I want you to understand how frustrating this is. All right? God said, Moses, I'm going to let you see the new job. But you ain't going to get it. I'm going to let you see the opportunity, but you won't be able to access it. All because you did not sanctify me in the midst of the people. Now, if you're reading this for the first time, you may be asking, what did Moses do? What would make God give him this type of punishment in order for us to understand this? Let's go to Numbers chapter 20. Let's go to Numbers chapter 20. Numbers 20. Numbers chapter 20. When you get it, let's go down to verse number 7. 
Numbers 20, verse number 7. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the rod and gather unto thou the assembly together, you and Aaron thy brother. And this is what I want you to do now. I want you to speak ye unto the rock before their eyes in front of them. Show them the power of your mouth. And it shall give forth water. And thou shalt bring forth to them water out of a rock. So thou shalt give the children of Israel, the congregation, and their beasts, their burden, their businesses to drink. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he had commanded. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation before the rock. And he said unto them, Hear now, ye rebels. Must ye fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod, he smote the rock. Not once, twice. And the water came out abundantly. Uh Uh-oh, look, it looks like God blessed it. (laughs) Looked like God rewarded it. And the congregation drank, and their beast also. Verse number 12, and the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron and said, because ye believed me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given to them. Tell somebody, I love the word. I love the word. I love the word. I love the word. Come on, one more verse. Let's go to Matthew 11. Matthew 11. Matthew 11. Just one verse, verse number 12. We read this last week, but I want to make sure that we put a period in our premise. Matthew 11, verse number 12, it says, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by I want you to know unequivocally, now now I'm saying this without any hesitation, I'm saying this without any question, hell does not like you. The enemy does not like you. Hear me, sin does not like you. I can say that with confidence, but you know what I can say with confidence? that you don't like sin. I know hell don't like you, but how do you feel towards hell? There are different degrees of hatred. There are different degrees of anger in the room. Over the next few weeks, it is God's responsibility, it is God's desire to give you His heart. And that also includes His anger. And God is going to teach us how to be godly angry and how to maneuver and move through it. Father, teach us how to war. Teach our fingers to fight. Teach us how to manage our anger, our rage, and our bitterness so that it would not break us. Teach us how to harness it for our assignment. Father, we thank you for clarity. We thank you that anger would not blur our vision. Give us peace. A drama-free life. That's what we're asking. We thank you for wisdom. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Come on, everybody say amen. Amen. Go ahead, take your seat for the next couple of weeks. I started this last week, but I'm going to do it this week. I'm preaching a message called, I'm mad as hell. I'm mad. I'm mad as hell. Now, I don't want you to get um, uh, taken aback. I don't want you to get nervous when I say that. Because I'm not trying to cuss, I'm not trying to be crude, what I'm trying to communicate is that in order for you to be successful, you have to be just as mad as hell is, let me say it again, in order for you to be successful, you have to be just as mad at hell as hell is mad at you. And some of us are not aware 
that hell is upset with us. Some of us are not aware that the enemy is after us, and he will use everything, every problem, every proclivity, every perversion, watch me, and even our personality to detour us. Because we don't want to deal with it, but I want, to, I want you to understand, for the next few weeks, I'm going to get in your face because some of y'all have an attitude problem. It's all right. Nobody got to say something to you for a second before you start getting a look. And you're the same one that got the Holy Ghost, same one that speak in tongues, same one that lay hands, same one that pray, but you can't control your own emotions? There's a common question that is asked in the Christian church. Can Christians have demons? And there's a lot of debate, a lot of conjecture, a lot of conversation. I'm going to give you the quick answer. Yes! There's a whole bunch of people that you sit next to that worship with you, pray with you, study the Bible, but they still cannot control their anger. I'm telling you, hear me. In church, they look good. When they worship, they look good. It usually starts to seep out the moment they get behind the wheel. Hear me. People turn into different beasts when they get behind the wheel. I've seen people that were polite, they were nice, they were courteous, but then when they got in the car, they didn't even put on a seat belt. See? See? Oh, it's going to be good. It's going to be good. What type of psycho? Don't put on a seatbelt. It's constricting. I know the law of God is constricting, but it's there to save you. I know the scripture seems like it's pulling you back, but it's there to create limitations to protect you. But there are some people, they don't like nothing constricting them. Now, this, thing, this thing is itchy. Frustrated. Agitated. Always got a frown on their face. Somehow, nobody ever say nothing to me. That's because you look mad. The Bible says if you're going to be a friend, you must show yourself friendly. But you can't even evangelize because you already look upset. So hear me. Over the next few weeks, God's going to fix your face. Nobody wants to come to church where everybody is mad, frustrated, agitated, on pins and needles, about to get on their last nerve, about to blow up at any moment. Hear me, y'all. If you are a Christian, you should have mastery over your spirit. You should not still be enraged. And so my anger to you this morning, I need you to write it down, take some notes, because some of y'all just staring at me. I need you to write down, what are you angry at? What are you mad at? Over the next few weeks, y'all, we are going to do a case study on a man by the name of Moses. And Moses is going to show us that some of us have every right to be angry. Come on, y'all. Some of us, our anger didn't start when we were born. Our anger started in the womb. You know that, you know that babies can be influenced spiritually even while they're in the womb. When your baby is in the womb, it becomes very important, the environment you begin to grow and nurture that child in. And while the baby is in the womb, if mama and daddy are constantly fussing and fighting, that baby comes out already frustrated because that has been the energy that incubated the baby. And some of y'all don't even know why you came out angry. Angry all your life. Everybody get on your nerves. Can't stand nobody. Always in a corner just scowling at somebody. God ain't doing nothing. You ain't happy? I am happy. They angry so much their happy face is still angry. Come on. You can't be that ugly. Come on, smile. You're telling me God ain't been that good. God ain't done nothing. God ain't opened doors. God ain't healed your body. God ain't made a way out of no way. God ain't giving you stuff that you didn't deserve. You're telling me you can't smile? Mean saints. Nasty saints. Angry saints. Just ready to bite the head off of any unassuming Christian.
But it's surprising because you don't usually notice it till you get behind the, behind the wheel. I've seen nice, peaceful, courteous people become beast behind the wheel. Going faster than their, hear me, going faster than their skill level. You shouldn't drive fast if you can't control. What you, hear me, don't drive fast if you can't control your sexuality. Why are you going fast in the relationship when you already know you don't wear seatbelts? And if you get in an accident, everybody's going to die. We say all going to die. Can you look at somebody and say, take your time, take your time. Now, we ain't going to deal with it today, but what if I told you that every stage of the relationship got speed limits? Some of y'all are doing 100 in your singleness and doing 25 when you marry. Come on now. Don't put your foot on the gas when you're single and then pump the brakes when you're married. So we're going to be dealing with this, and I can't wait, y'all. I'm so excited because I want you to understand that all anger is not bad. And so one of, we, one of the things that we're going to be doing over the course of the next few weeks is distinguishing and discerning the difference between godly anger. Come on, y'all, write it down. Godly anger and ungodly anger. Godly anger leads to godly action. I want you to write that down. Godly anger leads to godly action. If you are angry, if you, are, if, you are, if you have what they call righteous indignation, if your anger is activated by something holy, by something righteous, by something godly, it will always lead you to righteous action or godly action. Are y'all here? But ungodly anger will always lead to ungodly action and ungodly response and ungodly reaction. So we want to make sure that we bring a distinction between godly anger and ungodly anger. So we got a few assignments, y'all. I want you to write this down. We have a few assignments, and we want to make sure that we hit all of our goals and all of our objectives in this series. The first goal and objective we have is to establish a biblical worldview of anger. Now, come on. Christians are so confused. We don't know the difference between self-defense and murder. We got to get a biblical worldview of anger. Because some of the stuff we're seeing in Israel is not self-defense. I'm talking about, y'all, I'm talking to Christians, and I'm like, man, you know, Israel has to be careful bombing, you know, hospitals and babies. And they're saying, well, you know, Hamas is hiding under the hospital. And? So, so you're saying that because Hamas is, is, is hiding under the hospital, you can still drop a bomb on innocent people? See, y'all have been so Americanized, y'all think that that's Okay. If they hiding under it, get some soldiers and go in on the ground level. Don't drop a bomb on innocent people because if they're under the hospital, dropping a bomb on top of the hospital, still don't deal with the people under the hospital. I'm too political for you. I'm sorry. Too global for you. I'm sorry. We got to get a biblical worldview on what it looks like to be angry. Because some of us get angry and go, and go talk to the person that didn't make us angry. But if it's godly anger, it should lead you to godly action. And godly action is not to go to the person that didn't make you angry. It's to go to the person that's quiet. How do you think that the issue is going to be dealt with when you go to the people that didn't make you angry and the people that didn't make you angry just make you angrier? Go to the origin of the anger. So we want to look at a biblical worldview. I want God to establish a biblical worldview of anger so that we can have, watch this, I want you to write this down, so that we can strive for healthy emotional expression. Healthy emotional 
expression. You too old to still be having temper tantrums. Get a therapist. You need to stop venting and get a therapist. Because the venting ain't helping you or your relationship. It's toxifying all of your covenants because they just become trash cans for your anger and for your rage. Amen. They're not there for you to vent. You're not a fan. You're not an air condition. You ain't in high school no more. You can't get mad at your man and get on the phone with your friends. Come on, man of God, you can't get mad at her and go out with your boys and then you're going to stay out until it's 12, 1, 2 o'clock. I'm going to preach until somebody say amen. <laughs> Anger is destroying your marriage. Anger is destroying your family. Anger is destroying your relationship with your mama because you, you will not allow God to heal your heart. Just mad. So we want to have healthy emotional expression. The only way we can do that is to allow God to give us a biblical worldview of anger. Come on, y'all. We want to learn what godly anger is or we want to learn how to be godly angry. You know, the scripture says, be angry, but don't let the sun go down on your... So there is a way to be angry. Because please don't hear me. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. You are going to get angry. And it is, it is disingenuous to act like nothing upsets you. I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. Those are the people that kill people. I'm okay. No, no, I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. No, you are not okay. So nobody's asking you to sweep your anger under the rug, but we're asking you to address it with Scripture and not with your heart. Are y'all here? Amen. Sometimes I do get angry. Sometimes I get mad. At, I get mad. But I can't let anger steal from me what God has given me. Come on, y'all. I can't let anger steal from me what God has invested. If God has given me an opportunity, I'm almost there. If God has given me a relationship, why would I sabotage the relationship? Because I'm angry at the last. I ain't even angry at them. I'm angry at the last person, but some of us can attest that sometimes people are angry at something else, but they take it out. You got to learn to tell people, say, ha, I'm not who you angry at. Now, I haven't got to this point in our presentation, but I want you to write this down. This is what we call misdirected. God came to Adam. Adam, what happened? He had misdirected. Anger. Instead of being angry with your wife, bro, you should have been angry at you. Why are, you blaming, why are you blaming your wife? It was you that wasn't in the proper place and let your wife talk to a snake. Don't get mad at Eve. Get mad at yourself. Cain and Abel. Y'all remember Cain and Abel? All Abel, do, all Abel did was give God what God asked for, and Cain got upset looking at the way God responded to Abel's offering. Just mad, seething. Because people get mad when they watch God favor you. Hear me, people get mad when they watch God bless you because it reminds them that they had the opportunity to get blessed as well, but they did not do what you did. So they are, don't get mad. Come on, tell somebody, don't get mad at me. Hear me, don't get mad at my favor. Don't get mad at my opportunity. Don't get mad at my anointing. Don't get mad at my open. Don't get mad at me. Cain was upset. God spoke to Cain and said, Cain, why are you angry? He said, why are you angry? If you do well, will I not receive you? Hear me. Cain was angry, but it was an invisible legality that he was dealing with. It was something that he could not see. Have you ever felt like something was wrong, but you couldn't put your finger on it, you felt like you were in trouble, but you didn't know who you had to answer to. That is usually a sign that you have broken the law of God somewhere. 
And when we don't see fruit, when we don't see results, it can make us angry. And Cain was angry. And remember what the, remember what the Lord said. He said, if you do not well, sin lies at the door. There's good opportunity, bad opportunity, but if you allow anger to lead you, it'll always lead you to the wrong place. We want to learn how to be godly angry. Come on, y'all, number three. We want to learn the root of our anger. We want to learn, we want to look at, we want to discover, we want to investigate the root of our anger and allow God to heal unaddressed wounds. Y'all hear me. I want you to be better after this series. I want somebody to be able to cut you off and you not cuss them out. You say, Pastor, how do I know if this series is working? How do I know that I've grown? Because you become a lot more peaceful when people drive crazy. Now, I'm not just talking about physically driving. I'm talking about people that come in and out of your lane. I mean, in and out of your life. Amen. You you do not get distracted or discouraged based on their traffic, based on what they do. All right. We want to arrest rage. Come on, I want you to write this down. We want to arrest rage before it matures into murder. We want to arrest, you know, the Lord spoke to me, y'all, because um, uh, it's been just this year alone, just this year. I'm talking about last year uh, or a year and a half ago when my car was stolen. I'm talking about just this year. My car has been broken into three times. Three times. And the Lord, somebody laugh. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Glad I got peace. <laughs> no, I'm saying that because I was praying. And the Lord was ministering to me. Because the last time they stole, uh, the last time they broke into my car, they stole my book bag. And in my book bag was my passport. So I'm sure they're going through it. They find my passport. They see my name. Right? And I'm sure, maybe, maybe they search my name. Maybe they're trying to do some identity theft. Anytime somebody breaks into my car, I'm going to start making messages for them on Instagram. (laughs) Just in my story. So when they look me up, I'm like, I know it was you type of deal. (laughs) But I'm getting angry. I'm getting upset. And the Lord spoke to me and said, you know there's people in your church that break into cars too. The Lord said, you you preach all you want. But at some point, you need to start preaching to real stuff. Because there's adulterers in the audience. Oh, yeah, there's cheaters in the audience. There's extortioners in the art. I know it feels uncomfortable. There's thieves in the art. Some of y'all break into people's stuff too. I'm going to come over here. They say they don't come over here a lot. (laughs) Somebody said, Pastor, they need the word too. (laughs) Hear me. You are sitting around real people. Somebody cussed somebody out this week, left their job, said, I don't need this. You can shove it up your Bible. (laughs) And I want you to understand, hear me, God sees you. Whether you're a thief or whether you're a female abuser, God sees you. Please don't think that we're skipping over you or neglecting you or somehow we don't. No, we know you're here. There's all type of people, but not just, hear me, hear me, not just thieves and cheaters. There's some murderers too. Oh, yeah. I saw saw a documentary on Netflix. It was called Conversations with a Killer. And some of y'all don't know, when you're talking to people in the foyer, you're having a conversation. Oh, I get it. Y'all thinking I'm just talking about physical Murder. No, no. Hear me. Gossip will destroy reputations faster than murder will destroy their life. 
And you'll be surprised how many people get angry and just start killing people with their tongue. Oh, yeah, man. You know, I came into this church. I, I saw a girl, man. She looked kind of beautiful. You know she lesbian. I didn't, but thank you for the information. Why would you tell me that? What that got to do with anything? She got delivered. She got healed. She got restored. Why are you reminding me of who she used to be? Jesus said, if you look at a person with anger in your heart, you've already killed them. Some of y'all should be on death row because of all the people's character you done kill. Because of your harsh tongue. Oh, this is, I'm sorry. Some people's reputation have been irreversibly destroyed because of a lie you told. Hear me. There are things. I got to preach my presentation, y'all. There are things that God hates. I want you to go to Proverbs chapter 6. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 6. Y'all here? Let's go to Proverbs chapter 6. I just, I just got to lay a foundation. There's a lot of avenues. There's a lot of uh, intricacies. There's a lot of roads I can travel, but just allow me to kind of flow freely as the GPS takes me where he wants to take. Let's go, let's go to Proverbs 6. Proverbs 6. And when you get it, go down to verse number 16. Proverbs 6. Verse number 16. When you got it, let me know you got it by saying, I got it. These six things doth the Lord hate. I'm talking about they make him angry. Yeah, even seven. Look at what it says. It says, yeah, even seven. They are an abomination unto him. Look at verse number 17. It says, a proud look. Don't go too fast. Stay on that proud look. Why you look important when you don't do nothing? God hates a proud look. I did it myself. You sure? That associate's degree couldn't get that. That was only the favor of God. But you gotta. How proud you are of what? what? What have you built? Who have you healed? When was the last time you got somebody saved? Did you invite somebody to church? Why are you so proud? What you proud of? He said, I hate a proud look. We got to keep reading. Verse number 17 says, a proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent a heart that devises wicked imaginations, feet that are swift. What they say? <laughs> Who got the tea? You going to the club? It's, it's amazing how fast you move towards mischief, but if somebody, you waking up going to church? You going towards purpose? That's why I bless God for people that get speeding tickets on their way to church. Because if you get a speeding ticket on your way to the club, on your way to the hotel, on your way to the Airbnb, if you can get a speeding ticket going to do sin, you should be in a rush trying to get to the house of God. But some of y'all take your time on the road to destiny. It says, he hates a proud look. A lying tongue. Y'all hear? He says, hands that share innocent blood. A heart that devises wicked imaginations. Feet that run towards mischief. Look at this. A false witness that speaketh lies. And he that soweth discord among brethren. Y'all better understand. There are things that God hates that make him angry. Why don't they make you angry? I want you to just think about that. 
When God created Adam, he raised up Adam, brought all of the animals before Adam and said, Adam, I want you to name the animals. What God was doing, he was trying to see if him and Adam were in sync. If Adam would name all the animals, the very same thing that God had in his mind. If Adam was able to name the animals according to what God had in his mind, that was a sign that there was an irrevocable connection, this umbilical cord of revelation between God and Adam. God is always looking to see, does his people feel about stuff the same way he feels and we have the nerve to say well I don't I, I, I don't feel like I don't think it's an issue well if God thinks it's an issue then we should think it's an issue come on y'all I got to keep building this give me about five minutes and I'm gonna go ahead and, and, and establish part number one but I want you to continue to write this down these are our goals and our objectives we want to arrest rage before it matures into murder. I want to give you this process. I want you to write this down real quick. We're probably going to teach through this over the next couple of weeks, but I want you to write this down. Number one, perception. Perception creates attitude. Right? I want you to write that down. How you see it creates your emotional response towards it. All right? So perception creates attitude. Attitude creates offense. Attitude creates offense. I'm, I'm, I'm showing you how anger leads towards murder. A, uh, attitude creates offense. From offense, there's anger. It all starts with perception. From perception, there's an attitude. From the attitude, there's offense. From offense, there's anger. Now hear me. Anger turns into rage. Rage is anger without bounds. Meaning that even though you're angry at a person, since your anger no longer has bounds, there's collateral damage because you're willing to cuss anybody out because you are now enraged. And there are some of us that know people like that, and we say stuff like, give them time. You know how they is. They're going to blow up. You got to give them time. Hear me. It's time out. For us to give them time. Because no matter how much time you give a demon, a demon don't care nothing about the time. You don't give a demon time. You cast a demon out. And some of this stuff is not mental and emotional. Some of this stuff is not people's personality. Some of this stuff is demonic. How you over there in the corner just... <laughs> you all right? It was over some years ago, and you. <laughs> That's a demon. Because the Holy Ghost should be able to give you a little bit of control. Come on, Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of temperance. Amen. You should have self control that anger does not grow into rage to the point that it is uncontrollable. But it goes from anger. Hear me. And if anger matures into rage when you allow people to feed it, they did what to you? You let them do that? If I were you. And you're sitting there like, yeah. <laughs> Hear me, y'all. Don't let people talk you into fights that they ain't going to even help you win. <laughs> they going to be gone. The moment you go, be like, yeah, did you say... When you feed anger, it becomes uncontrollable. It loses limitations and it becomes rage. Rage goes into slander. Slander is illegal spiritual speech. It is speaking negative about a person's character without their ability to defend themselves. Slander. In the legal world, it's called defamation of character. And you can sue somebody for defaming your character. And hear me, some of us are mad. The people, they, they talked about me, they lied on me, but we forget all the people we talked about and we lied on. Have you ever noticed people get angry first, but they become the victim later? You never know, they're like, ah, and then it becomes, but you all know what they did to me. 
A lot of times anger is just a defense for insecurity. That's a way of looking big when they really feel small. So, so your perception, if you don't manage your perception right, hear me, you'll get mad at good people. If you don't manage your perception right, you'll get mad at the people that want God's best for you. But just because they don't let you do everything you want to do, you get upset and you end up running off productive friendships. Because you were angry. So don't allow your anger to be fed, to grow, turn into rage, and then slander. Slander is the language of rage. I want you to write that down. Slander is the language of rage. When a person is angry, they just talk about everybody wild. Like, like dang, you don't like nobody? You got an issue with Everybody. And hear me, you can tell that they are not mature Christians because mature Christians understand we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. So I'm not speaking against people. Thank you for your Presbyterian clap. It's all right. I'm talking about this is an Anglican church this morning. That's... No, no, don't, don't get Pentecostal now. It's okay. I feel like sprinkling people. I feel like. We ain't baptizing today. We sprinkling today. It's amazing how saved we are, but how angry we are. I'm talking about how filled with the Holy Ghost we are, how mad at people we are. It is surprising. You don't, you don't strain, you don't get confused at that dichotomy, that difference, that people can be smiling in one moment. And turn just like that, like Jekyll and Hyde. Holy one moment, crazy the next. And we're going to be looking at this from the life of Moses because Moses shows us that, hear me, there are sometimes we have every right to be angry. I want you to write this down. Just because you have a right to be doesn't mean you are right to be. Did you hear what I said? Just because you have a right to be doesn't mean you're right to be. Did y'all hear me? Just because you have a right to be angry and to fight doesn't mean you're righteous in doing it. Just because the world make it legal don't mean it's right before the eyes of God. And just because you have a right to cuss them out because they cut you off and did something to you doesn't mean you're going to be representing God the right way. And guess what? Moses had every right to be angry. Oh, yes, he did. He has grown up through being an orphan, through being adopted, from being rejected and abandoned. He has every right to be angry. Yet God says, control your anger. Come on, God. Come on. I'm not talking about the stuff people put me through. I'm talking about the stuff God put me through. You allowed me to be born here, and you allowed this person to do this, and you allowed this, and you allowed this. I ain't mad at everybody else. If we could be honest, there are some people in the room, you are mad at God. Maybe you were born with a disease. Maybe a child was born with an ailment, and you are mad at God. Worship, praise. The only reason I'm coming is because my wife made me. The only reason I'm here is because I feel like it's my duty. But if I could be honest, I am mad at God because I didn't get married at 23, because I didn't get my business at 30. I haven't wrote my book since I was 35. I am mad at God. I sold, and the door didn't open. Come on now, I took a lap around the church and the cancer did not disappear. I'm angry. And God's saying, guess what? I know how you feel. Because look at how much I've done for you. And you've not once been grateful. Look at, look at how much I've done for people and they've not once yet turned their devotion toward. I know what it feels like. Moses I know what it feels like to be angry, to be upset, not just with people, 
up with the sovereign circumstance I find myself in. Why was I born into this family? Why did auntie or uncle touch me and nobody was there to save me? Just because you have a right to be angry. That anger is spoiling your heart. Hear me, y'all. It is infecting your anointing. You're anointed, but anytime you do what God has called you to do, there's a little bitterness. And it's because we feel your anger. We hear your anger. Moses had every right to be angry, but God puts Moses in a place where he has to manage his personality in order for him to enter into promise. And just like all of us, we don't have the excuse that that's just the way we are. Because some of us got to change who we are. Hear me, Moses had every right to be angry because God raised him up to go into Egypt and to deliver people that didn't even like him. Okay now, against my will, against my better judgment, I'm going to lead people that don't like me. Come on, it's clergy appreciation month. Hear me, if we can thank anybody, we need to thank Moses because Moses led two, two million people. All day long, you know what they did? Chirp, chirp, chirp. Mo who, told, who gave Moses the right to be in charge? Who gave Moses that rod? Who told Moses and Aaron that they were the big shot? Who told Moses, Aaron, and Miriam? This is nepotism. They only choose people in their family. I can't stand it. It's too hot out here. Where's the water? Where's the food? I can't believe they brought us all the way out. Where's the garlic? Where's the leeks? I should have stayed in Egypt. I could have died back then. Wait, weren't you praying for 430 years for God to raise up a deliverer? And the moment God gives you what you ask for, you still angry? Maybe you just mad. Maybe it ain't got nothing to do with God. Maybe it ain't got nothing to do with people. Maybe you just got an attitude problem. Moses said, I'm trying to help you. Moses had every right to be angry. They were upset. They, man, Moses, what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? Moses said, bro, I got you. I've been praying for you all night long, and God has now given me a revelation. God speaks to Moses. Moses, I want you to take the rod, not to hit the rock, but to represent authority. They're already questioning who you are. They're already questioning your legitimacy. How you get to lead us, and who made you the pastor, and why you get to preach all the time. They already think. So what I want you to do, I want you to take your rod. I want you to walk out in front of the people because I'm going to show them that you ain't even got to lift a finger. Come on now. I'm going to show them that it ain't you. It's me. I'm going to show them that you didn't put yourself in charge. If you did, you might have to beat rocks in order for water to come out of them. But I'm going to show them that it was me that put you in place. How? By speaking to it. Come on now, I want you to show them my supernatural power by getting an issue. Don't touch it. I'm going to touch it for you. But what I want you to do, I want you to speak to it. I want you to show them how masterful I am. Come on now, don't put it in your own strength. Because if you do that, they might think it's your might that brought the water out. And I want them to know I got you. So don't speak to the rock. I want you to, don't, don't hit the rock. I want you to speak to it. So Moses, I can, I can imagine Moses is excited. I don't have to exert any effort. You're going to give me the job without any sweat. You're telling me all I got to do is decree a thing. And it shall be established for my sake. That's what you're telling me? Well, good God on my... So Moses stands up. He said, everybody, come. I got a new technology. Everybody start inching close to Moses. What is he about to do now? Because you know, Moses, he's angry. Oh, yeah. Y'all don't remember when he killed that man in Egypt? He allowed his anger to turn into rage and to turn into murder. Y'all don't, y'all be, better not mess with Moses now. He's a killer. Say, man, he got anger issues. They start tipping up. Man, it's hot out here. 
Moses is standing in front of people. All of you ready? What are you about to do? It's hot out here, ain't it? They ain't got no shade. Moses hear it, and his blood just started boiling. Come on now. He's trying to stay peaceful. He's trying to stay calm. He came out with a good attitude, but not long before they get there, they start, what is he doing? Why he got this stick? He always got a stick somewhere. What is, what is he doing? He's trying to intimidate us. I ain't intimidated because I talk to God myself. Why are you standing by that rock? Man, we thirsty. Moses! You don't see me praying. Moses! We thirsty. What you think I brought you here for? I brought you here to give you some water. Just give me a second. I'm trying to work my... Not long. Are we there yet? How long we got to wait? I'm trying to pray. Out of the rock shall flow rivers of living water, but I got to, let me do what I got to do. Let me wait for everybody to get, oh, they're tired. So Moses is there trying to do what God called him to do, but people keep agitating him. Come on, how long we got to wait? When are you going to do it? When are we going to get the water? Okay, if you just give me a, what, what, what? And he takes the rod. Hear me, trying to help. Moses ain't mad because he had a bad day. He's mad because people don't appreciate his sacrifice. Hear me. He's got every right. He's got every right to cuss them out. But just because he has a right to doesn't mean it's right to. I'm done here. He takes the rod and strikes the rock and water flows. It looks like God blessed it. Come on now, because when you told them off and you gave them a piece of your mind and they apologized and said they were wrong, you went back to your friends and said, the water flowed. I told her, uh-huh, I told her, and she said it was her fault, and she said that she shouldn't have did it. I'm telling you, it's a spiritual victory for me. And God is sitting there saying, I hate a proud look. I hate a lying tongue. Just because people drunk don't mean that they were spiritually satisfied. And just because it worked don't mean it was right. Amen. You can stand on your feet. Part number one. Come on, let's go home. 